Madhur Jaffrey joins me now in Studio Q. Welcome. Hello. So uh, Indian food is everywhere now, uh, right down to butter chicken flavored potato chips. Uh, <laughs> what did British people think of Indian flavors, though, when you arrived there in the late 1950s from India? Well, they, they had some version of Indian food. I wouldn't uh, give it any high praise, but it was there. And I, in fact, if it had been any better, I would never have cooked. I would have eaten that better food. But it was so bad <laughs> that I, had, I was getting more and more desperate. And uh, the only way I could find the food that I grew up with, the wonderful Indian food that you find in homes, mm -hmm. was to write to my mother and say, please, please, please teach me how to cook. And I couldn't make tea. I couldn't make rice. I was really at a very bad stage of cooking. And I was over 20, so I should have known better, but I didn't. So my mother sent me these letters back with recipes, take a little bit of this, add a little bit of that, but they were three-line recipes. I learned from those, and I started cooking from those, from nothing. And slowly then I said, send me more recipes and more recipes. And I improvised a little bit. I added to them because I remember the flavor of everything. Hmm. And so somehow I was able to get back to the taste that I grew up with. And that's how I learned. On the flip side, what did you first think of British food when you arrived there? The, the Indian food wasn't impressing you in Britain, but what did you think of the British food? Well, I have to tell you, this is the late 1950s, uh -huh. so it's shortly after the war. The best thing to eat that I could afford, I was a student, was fish and chips, which is not as good now because now there are not as many fish shops. People eat less fish than they used to. There it was always the freshest of fish. So I could always get a fish and chips meal and uh, get myself a bottle of nice wine, which I was learning about. I knew nothing about drinking wine then, but I was learning, and I was learning from masters about how to, what to drink. So I think that would have kept me going. But mm. the Indian food just added the wonderful aromas of my hometown and helped my craving, my homesickness for, for Indian food. So as a young adult, you're learning about cooking for the first time. You're learning about wine for the first and time. And I'm smoking. I was learning how to smoke, which I'd never done. It was a brief period, but I did smoke, and I would sit with a coffee and feel very European, you know. <laughs> Somehow a new thing was happening to me, and this sense of adventure came from the smoking and mm. drinking and, um, and yearning for Indian food. Would you have described yourself at that time uh, in the terminology of today a foodie? I didn't know what foodie was. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand the word. And, of course, the word didn't exist then. And I was not a foodie. Hmm. I didn't think of food as something that you aspired to, uh, to longing for in that professional kind of way. I was just a simple actress trying to find a way in life who loved the bohemian life, eating and drinking hmm. and being merry. And you, and you just wanted this food from home that you missed. That's so right. Dearly. It was an inner craving. Hmm that I just needed to fulfill because I could not eat bad food. I had grown up with excellent food cooked in the house, and I just craved good food of that sort. Okay, before we get into your television career and, and the rest of the cooking, you arrived yeah. in London, as we said, on the cusp of the swinging 60s to attend RADA, the famous right. theater school. Yes. What were your ambitions at that time? Oh, to be Marlon Brando. I had seen, we had seen all the early Marlon Brando films, and to me... It wasn't the Indian film industry that was driving me. It was the, the Western style, uh, the method, as it was called uh, at that time. It was that that excited me and interested me, and that's what I wanted to really learn, how to do, get the, the character right inside you, draw it from mm. yourself. And Marlon Brando was the best example of that. So I said, that is what I want. I dream, I dream of being Marlon Brando someday. <laughs> what, what was it about that particular style of, of cinema that captivated you, that connected with you? It was so uh, from the guts. It, the, th the character came not out of some great imagining and thinking. It was as if you were drawing it from within yourself and making yourself that human being in your emotions, in your intellect, even in your physical self, becoming that other person. Quite magical. Quite magical. What kind of roles were open to an Indian actress at that time? Okay. 
Middle Eastern girls who dance in front of sheiks, as they were called, are horrible parts. And mm. the only parts uh, that were being given to me, especially when I came to America just after that, were really the kind of Indian that doesn't exist, which swayed between a Middle Eastern imagined whore and uh, an imagined Indian. Not real, wow. not real. So you couldn't just play a secretary. You played this exotic creature that doesn't really exist, exist mm. in, 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 uh, perhaps in someone's imagination. You've acted in everything from Merchant Ivory period films to indie movies about the Indian American experience. Were you interested in telling all sorts of stories about the Indian experience and, and its diaspora as well? I was interested in getting a part. <laughs> <laughs> I was just happy. Give me some work. Give me some real good part and I'll do it. It was that desperate mm. initially. But of course, the ideal is to get some juicy role that tells a wonderful story. That's the ideal. What do you think now when you look at the landscape of possibilities for, for Indian actors? Much better. My daughter's an actress. She, her name is Sakina Jaffrey, and she was in House of Cards. She does a lot of stuff, and she plays Mindy's mother in Mindy's project. And So she's, she, her generation, mm -hmm. which includes people like Asif Manvi, they are doing much better. Much, I'm happy to see that. They still don't get regular jobs. They're not constantly working, mm -hmm. all of them. But they work, and they're much better parts for them than they were for me. Has it been gradual, or did you see a key sort of turning point? I think it's been very gradual, gradual and very slow. You brought Indian culture to the West through your acting roles and your cooking TV shows uh, of the 80s and 90s. How did you approach bridging the gap uh, in terms of cooking uh, between food that was prepared at home uh, for a non-Indian audience? How did you approach bridging that gap? Um... I, for a long time, for 20 or 30 years, I was the consultant at a restaurant in, in New York. And what I try to do, because I just, I feel that if you give quality to people, they will like it. And I tried to serve at this restaurant the best regional Indian food, mm -hmm. which had been got from homes, because I think Indian cooking is the best in homes. And my new book, the vegetarian book, actually deals with food from homes. All I have in there is that wonderful home cooking, home vegetarian food that you find all over India in great variation. So I thought if I brought that to the restaurant, uh, people would be interested because the quality is so high and it's so flavorful and wonderful. Mm. We're very used at this point to celebrity chefs, but what was it like cooking on television in the 80s and 90s? I never call myself a chef because I'm not. I cannot chop like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can't chop with speed or accuracy. Mm -hmm. I chop very slowly, I cut very slowly. So I'm a housewife that cooks. I just love food and I can explain it to people, I can explain to people how to cook something. I'm good at that because I'm a good teacher. I think. Is that the key to the art of, of, um, of demonstrating cooking on television? I think so, yeah. absolutely. I, and in writing books, how anxious are you to communicate every last technique that you're using to the person who's going to be reading or watching what you're doing? And you must be really, I will give all, I will ex expose myself, I will tell you everything mm. so that you get it absolutely perfect. That's my aim. Do you think it, it actually helped that you started cooking later in life as far as teaching, being able to teach? Perhaps, because mm -hmm. I was a beginner and I knew that I needed to know certain things to cook well. And that's what I do in my books. I will teach you. I'll hold your hand through the whole thing and teach you how to cook very well. Uh, your new book, as I mentioned, is called Vegetarian India. Uh, what do you make of the new hipness of vegetarian cuisine in North America? I don't trust hipness where food is concerned. I think food evolves. It, it finds its own balance. It settles into what it is. I think you can't impose on it. Um, I think it takes time for a cuisine to develop. So I trends come and go. 
but quality stays. Quality stays. Um, I expect in India, you talked about home cooking in India. I expect yeah. people uh, there aren't eating butter chicken every night. How is home cooking where you're from specifically in India different from uh, what we see here in the West? Well, for example, I think butter chicken is a very good example. You will go out perhaps once in a month and have butter chicken. You would die of a heart attack <laughs> if you ate butter chicken every day. So families care about their children in India just as much as they do here. And that kind of diet would be a no-no only because of its cholesterol and fat and mm -hmm. everything else, all those problems that we recognize here. So your daily diet would be less oil, less fat, a lot of vegetables, a lot of beans and, and grains of different sorts. And that is the healthiest diet. And that's why, and I think one of the reasons why Indian vegetarian food is so wonderful and good and good for you is because it's had thousands of years of development. Mm. Things have been subtracted that were not right. Things have been added that were right. Uh, and a whole cuisine has developed that's fully balanced. Mm. And where else can you get that? That's why I don't trust trends. I say time is the best trend. Interesting. Then it's a matter of survival. If you eat too much butter chicken, you're dead. <laughs> so who survives? Who's the healthiest person? Mm. Who lives to be 92 uh, or now 102? Yeah. Uh, so that over time tells you what the best diet is. And I think that's what's happened in cultures like China, mm -hmm. you know, the older cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, what we follow in India. And it's, it's sometimes you don't even know that that's what you're following. Yeah. It's uh, something. You don't know everything that's gone into that right, tradition of right. cooking. Right. Your yeah. grandmother just says, do this, and you do it. Mm -hmm. But you don't know she's saying it because her grandmother said it and, and so on all the way back. And they were said for a reason. It's very interesting. Uh, Jamie Oliver was here yesterday. And we yeah. were talking about cooking all over the world. Um, and he brought up the fact that in many of the, the poorer countries in the world, people live to be very long. Mm. I brought up uh, my grandmother in, in uh, rural Rwanda, who's over 100. And, you know, it's exactly that, those traditions passing on. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the recipes in this book, they span regions. Mm -hmm. What do they tell us about different parts of India? Well, they, they tell you, first of all, that the food is different <laughs> in every region of India. And so this time, one of the things I did was not... Uh, go by plane from one city to another. I went by car and sort of crossed the country to see what was happening in each little place. And in each little place, it is different. So I would hop out of the car if I saw a little stand selling something. Mm -hmm. I would hop out to see what it was. And I went to areas that I'd never gone before. For example, one of the areas I went to is called Kurg. And it's in the mountains it's uh, on the west side of India, near, near the coast, but the mountains rise from the coast. Okay. So it's a particular kind of wet tropical climate. Uh, the British used to call that area the Scotland of India because mm -hmm. it was not so hot there because it was mountains. And coffee goes, grows there and um, what else? Cardamom grows there. And, uh, it's an, but in the rainy season, all that stops and there's nothing because it rains steadily for four months. Okay. But something does grow, and they forage for it. And that is mushrooms and bamboo shoots and ferns mm. of various sorts. So they have a whole cuisine in the monsoon season that is based on all these things, and it's incredible. I have mm. some dishes for mushrooms, for example, in the book that are so they have five or six ingredients. That's it. And you can use button mushrooms. You can use them, any mushrooms that you find. And it's got coconut milk, and it's nice and spicy, and mm. you can have it with rice. You can have it on toast. It's delicious. Uh, okay. I want to ask you about what you eat at home because I Indian cooking isn't all uh, that it happens in your home. Your husband is African-American right. from the South. Uh, he's also a food lover. Yes. So what do you guys eat and, and cook at home? Well, he has his urges and I have my urges. So we need to satisfy both. He'll suddenly make a batch of biscuits because that's what he wants. Mm -hmm. And I will eat them, but I will eat them as a scone because I have a little bit of British uh, background because we were a colony. So we share 
that in a, some strange kind of way. A biscuit becomes a scone for me. Hmm. And then he will make um, an apple pie. But he never, he cooks Chinese and everything else like I do. But the only thing he won't touch is Indian food. He won't make that. So I Oh, said, he won't make it. He'll he, eat it, but he he'll, won't Oh, he'll eat it. <laughs> but he won't make it. And I said, why don't you make it? He, first, he said, you don't label anything. So my daughter went and labeled every spice. And there were, you know, 30, 40 of them. She labeled everyone. He still wasn't cooking. So I said, why don't you cook? And then he said, all right, all right, I- I'll cook. So tell me, how do I make dal? So I said, here's the recipe. Now you go, go and make it. And he did. And it was very good. So he's learned certain basic things that he'll make when I'm gone. And mm-hmm. he's uh, yearning for it. But if I'm there, he drops everything and I do the he Indian food. He sticks to his thing and you, yes, you stick yes, to yours. Yes, okay, exactly. I have time for just one more question. Yes. Um, over the years, what's the biggest change you've seen in terms of the reputation of Indian food uh, in the West? Well, I live in America. So I can tell you about America, and the change is minimal. And I don't know why, because Korean food, Japanese food, Americans know much more about that. Indian food, I I keep saying, we've had, America has had no war with India. If they'd had a war, they would know India more intimately, and they would know the food more intimately. Hmm. They know Vietnamese food better than they know Indian food. But they're learning. It's a very slow process that's happening there. But it's slowly they're learning more and more dishes. They're, mm-hmm. they're learning that it's beyond Vindaloo. There's something else in the world of Indian cookery. <laughs> Has all of this given you a window into the way cross-cultural understanding happens and works? Well, Your work with food. I think food is cross-cultural. No country exists in a vacuum. And everybody has borrowed something from someone else, whether it's a technique. In India, look at our ingredients, chilies, potatoes, tomatoes. Where are they from? They're all from the Western world. Mm. So we have, we have borrowed since 4,000 BC, 10,000 BC we borrowed. Wheat wasn't original to India. It came from the Middle East. It came to the Middle East for most places, uh, from the Mesopotamia area. So you do learn to get things from other countries, and then you acclimatize yourself to them, and then you make them your own. Hmm. It's this process of making it your own that America hasn't fully done. It's undigested, but it's all coming in a rush. Hmm. And now is the process of sorting it all out. Thank you so much. Thank you.